Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about and give a brief introduction to what we call sequences. And so we're going to start with some important uh, definitions and terminology related to sequences. And so let's go ahead and get started. So an infinite sequence, or what we're just going to call a sequence for short, is an ordered list of numbers of the following form. Two common ways we'll see our sequences expressed are using the set notation or in a listed format. And so the curly brackets kind of indicate something is in a set. And so here a sub n is representing like an explicit formula for the uh, terms in our sequence. And here this other notation is saying our n value starts at 1 and goes off towards infinity because we are talking about infinite sequences now. It is not uncommon for us to drop the uh, sub and superscript of n equals 1 in infinity if it is kind of obvious given the context. So you might not always see that. Another common way our sequences will be uh, expressed is using a ordered list like we see here. And this is where we actually take the time to write the terms in our sequence out like a1, a2, a3, a4, and so on. a sub i is just representing some random uh, term in our sequence and it just keeps on going forever. So a couple other important uh, terms and definitions that we'll be using throughout our discussion here is n, which is the uh, common subscript that we see throughout our sequence, is representing the index variable or just the index of our sequence. We can kind of think of that subscript of n as telling us which term are we at in our sequence. So are we at the first term, second term, third term, or what? It is very common for our sequences to start at n equals 1, but n equals 0 is another common starting point. And technically, you could start at any n value you want, like n equals negative 3 or n equals positive 2, but 0 and 1 are our typical starting points. Another important note about these index variables is that they're always integers, so they're always those whole numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, never fractions or irrational numbers like 1 half, square root of 2, or pi. And another term that I've already used a couple times in this video is what is a term in a sequence? And that's just one of the numbers in our ordered list or the sequence itself. So a sub n in general is just a term of our sequence. So next up, I want to look at a, uh, an example of a sequence and then uh, two common ways that we represent or describe our sequences. So for our first sequence, we're going to look at together. Let's let the first term be 2, the second term be 4, the third term be 6, then 8 and so on. And so we want to go ahead and give a couple different descriptions of this first sequence, 2, 4, 6, 8, all these even integers. And the first format we're going to use is an explicit formula for our terms in our sequence. And so what would the formula uh, be for a sub n that generates the terms in our sequence as we plug in these different n values? This is basically like finding a function that describes the terms in our sequence. So if we plug in our starting index value, in this case n equals 1, we have to get 2. If we plug in n equals 2, we should get 4. If we plug in n equals 3, we should get 6, and so on. And since these are the even integers, our pattern recognition can just kind of help us figure out that the explicit formula for this sequence is 2 times the n value, or the index value. We're going to be doing tons of different things with these sequences, like finding their limits, adding the terms up to create what we call a series later on, and more. Um, and the explicit formula, like a sub n is equal to some function of n, is going to be the most common way that we work with our sequences. But there is another way, and that's what we call using a recursive formula. So when we're using a recursive formula to define the terms in our sequence, the way this works is we define the next term in our sequence using the previous term. So if we think of a sub n as our next term, the previous term would come from the index value before this, like n minus 1. So if we think about our sequence here, 2, 4, 6, 8, how would we go from the first term to the second term, or from 2 to 4? We'd have to add 2 to it. How would we go from 4 to 6? We'd have to add another 2. From 6 to 8, we'd have to add another 2, and so on. So our recursive formula for the sequence of even integers that we're looking at here would look like the previous term denoted as a sub n minus 1 plus 2. Or if you preferred, and you might see this in some uh, sources, you might write the next term as a sub n plus 1, then the previous term or the current term would be a sub n. So we could also write this as a sub n plus 1 is equal to a sub n, the term before the one we're considering, plus 2. 
Another common thing that is usually needed with these recursive formulas is like a base case or a starting point. So in order to get our recursive formula kind of going, we need the starting point. And here our starting point or our a sub one value would just be two. And so sometimes we only use uh, two or three of the numbers in our sequence to find one of these explicit formulas or recursive formulas. But once we think we found a formula that describes the terms in our sequence, we should always double check it by plugging in some different n values or using the recursive formula to make sure it gives us the terms that we actually are wanting or desiring. So if we plug in n equals one for our explicit formula, we get two. If we plug in two, we get four. If we plug in three, we get six. Plug in four, we get eight, and so on. So that explicit formula seems to be working. If we check out our recursive formula, the first recursive formula starts at n equals two. Then if we plug in n equals two, we get a sub two. The second term in our sequence would be a sub two minus one or a sub one plus two. Well, what is a sub one? It is two. And if we take that two and add another two to it, we get four, so a sub two, the second term in our sequence would be four. If we plug in n equals three, this should generate the third term in our sequence. And if we plug in three here, we have to plug in three over here as well, but that'd be three minus one or two. So that says the third term in our sequence would be the second term plus two. The second term plus two is four plus two, and that gives us six. So our recursive formula, as well as our explicit formula, both describe the terms in our sequence. And sometimes you may see multiple different explicit or recursive formulas that describe the exact same sequence. We just have to watch out for things like that. Maybe it's just a, a difference in doing some algebra to simplify some expressions, or for these recursive formulas, maybe there's just a, a totally different way to describe it all together. And so an arithmetic sequence is a special type of sequence where if we take any two kind of uh, consecutive terms in our sequence and subtract them from each other, we will get a constant difference. So an arithmetic sequence will have a constant difference between the terms. So if we do four minus two, we get two. Six minus four is also two. Eight minus six is again two. So that's what makes this an arithmetic sequence. All right, so let's go ahead and look at another example of a sequence that'll be of our second type of very important and super popular sequences. And so the first term in this sequence is two thirds. The second term is four ninths. The third term is eight twenty sevenths. The fourth term is sixteen eighty firsts and so on. So let's go ahead and try to find an explicit formula for the terms in this sequence. So our first term is two thirds. Our second term is four ninths. What do we have to do to go from two thirds to four ninths? And will that formula or pattern or process also be able to be used to go from four ninths to eight twenty sevenths or from our second term to our third term, as well as the rest of the terms that we have listed in front of us? And so one kind of really important observation we need to make here is we're not just adding like the same thing to the numerator and the denominator each time or to each term. That doesn't work. So this is not an arithmetic sequence. But what we should be able to notice is the numerator is always doubling and the denominator is always tripling. So we're essentially just always multiplying the uh, numerator by two and the denominator by three. So what we're really actually looking at here are just different powers of two thirds. So our explicit formula for this sequence is two over three, all raised to the power of n. So let's go ahead and check this explicit formula by plugging in some different n values and seeing if it generates our list of terms in our given sequence. So again, we're assuming that we're gonna start at n equals one. So if we plug in n equals one, we get two thirds to the power of one, which is just two thirds our starting point. So, so far, so good. Well, this needs to generate the rest of the terms in our list or sequence as well. If we plug in n equals two, what is two thirds squared? Well, that's gonna be four ninths. If we plug in n equals three, we are gonna get eight over 27, and you can go ahead and check it yourself. If we plug in n equals four, we'll get 16 over 81. So using this explicit formula, we can kind of quickly generate the next term or a future term far off in the distance. Like what would the 100th term of this sequence be? Well, that'd be two thirds to the power of 100. And then we could off to the side actually calculate the numerator and the denominator if we were that interested. All right, so next let's go ahead and try to describe our sequence again, but now using a recursive formula. 
So how can we write the nth term in terms of the n minus one or the previous term? And so what we can notice from our previous observation of how we derived our explicit formula is the way we went from our first term to our second term or from our one term to our next term was just basically multiplying in another factor or power of two thirds. So if we take our previous term of a sub n minus one and multiply it by two thirds, that'll generate the next term in our sequence. And we can check this out. If we plug in n equals two, then the second term a sub two will just be two thirds times the a sub first or first term. And so when we are using these recursive formulas, remember we need to have a starting value or a starting point. And in this case, that'll be our first term of two thirds. And the second example of the sequence we're looking at is what we call a geometric sequence. So an arithmetic sequence will have a constant difference between consecutive or adjacent terms, while a geometric sequence will have a common ratio between consecutive or adjacent terms. So for the arithmetic sequence, we are always adding in a constant from one term to the next, while with a geometric sequence, we will always be multiplying by a constant to go from one term to the next. And so another thing we're often going to be interested in with these sequences is what is their limit or n behavior or what happens to the terms as we take the limit as n goes to infinity. So when we're working with these recursive formulas for our sequences, it can often be hard to determine what that limit as n goes to infinity will be. And the explicit formulas will often be a lot more useful for finding the limits of our sequences. We can basically just use a lot of those limit rules that we learned in calculus one to help us find the limit of a sequence when it's written in this explicit form. So for example, in this sequence here, we see our explicit formula that generates the terms in our sequence is two thirds to the power of n. And so if we take the limit of a sub n as n goes to infinity, we're gonna get zero. And so for this sequence, the limit of the terms in our sequence converges and it converges to the constant of zero. In our previous example, that arithmetic sequence where we just had the even integers, that'll be a sequence that diverges to positive infinity. And so not every sequence we look at will be an arithmetic sequence or a geometric sequence. They're just two very popular and important types of sequences we need to know about. So before we move on, I wanna look at one more example of a very famous and important sequence. And so in this example, I want us to list the first six terms of the recursively defined sequence where a sub n is equal to a sub n minus one plus a sub n minus two, given that the first two terms in our sequence are a sub zero equals zero and a sub one equals one. And maybe some of you have seen this sequence before. This is what we call the Fibonacci sequence. And so we see our recursive formula for the Fibonacci sequence is a little bit more complicated than our first example. It's bringing back the first two terms or the previous two terms in order to generate that next term. And so we'll often see things like this when we look at the recursive formulas for our sequences, we might pull back a couple terms or two or three terms back or something like that. And they might also mix this kind of recursive formula with an explicit formula. So you might see a previous term added in or manipulated by some function of the index n. Anything can kind of go here when we're describing our sequences. But let's go ahead and finish this exercise off. Let's go ahead and list the first six terms of the Fibonacci sequence by using these two base terms and our recursive formula. So I guess the first two terms are already kind of given to us zero and one. So we really just need to list the next four. And so if we wanted to list that third term that actually correspond to a subscript of two, because we're starting at zero here for this example. So a sub two would be a sub one plus a sub zero. So we're just adding the previous two terms together in order to generate the next term. And zero plus one is one. Well, now that we've kind of recognized all we have to do to get the next term in our Fibonacci sequence is take the previous two terms and add them together. We can do that a little bit quicker. One plus one will give us two. Two plus one will give us three. Three plus two will give us five. Three plus five will give us eight. Five plus eight will give us 13 and so on. And so it looks like we did uh, list the, uh, the next six terms besides the ones that were given. So we went maybe a little bit further than we needed to go, but we got the job done. 
And so some of you have probably heard of the Fibonacci sequence before. There's tons of material out there about the Fibonacci sequence, so we won't get too deep into it. But there are a couple other notes I want to make about this special sequence. And so if you have heard about the Fibonacci sequence before this video, you've also probably heard about this quantity called the golden ratio. And here I'm denoting the golden ratio with the symbol of phi, and that's exactly equal to 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, which is approximately 1.618. And so we're definitely not going to take the time to uh, derive the explicit formula for the nth term of our Fibonacci sequence in this video. I just wanted to share it with you because I think it is very cool. And so here I'm using uh, f sub n instead of a sub n because we're talking about this very famous Fibonacci sequence. And so to generate the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence, we just take that golden ratio number 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, raise it to the power of n, subtract away from that number 1 minus our golden ratio raised to the power of n, and divide all that by the square root of 5. It's a very complicated formula, especially if we wrote it in terms of 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 instead of phi. But what I find so amazing about this formula is it does generate the terms in our Fibonacci sequence, but it's also riddled with all these irrational numbers like the square root of 5. But every time we plug an integer n into it, we get a, another integer like 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on as an output. 